welcome to Managing Love Intelligently. I'm Jason. And I'm Stephen E. And Steve here is a licensed marriage and family therapist with over 30 years experience. And I'm the guy who asks him the hard hitting questions. <laughs> um, maybe some real hard hitting ones today. So get ready. I'm laughing because, but that's a nervous laugh because it's actually true. I never know what the questions are and uh, they usually always catch me a bit off guard because I am utterly unprepared. Yeah, yeah, that's the way I like it. It's really <laughs> tough to see if he's got the knowledge behind him. <laughs> so today's topic is learning to embrace rejection. So Steve could think about that for a bit. And before we kick off the conversation, if you have a question for Steve, visit stevening.com and fill out the contact form. At the end of each episode, Steve will answer your listener questions. So stay tuned for that. I also want to say if you enjoy the podcast and find the information helpful, please subscribe and share it with your friends and family. And if you really enjoy the podcast, please consider leaving a review. That stuff really helps us a lot in getting the word out to more people. And if you don't just really like it, but you actually, in fact, fall in love with Jason, who is single, <laughs> if you could leave small donations, that would be really good on our sub stack. Yes. <laughs> and then I could use those... Or for dating, dating yeah. yeah. <laughs> so subscriptions are available. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to talk about rejection because a lot of people are afraid of it. And my, I've been thinking recently after working with you and um, kind of just growing as a person, I think if you could get past the fear of rejection, you could manage love much more intelligently. So that's kind of like what I'm thinking. But anyways, what do you think about? I was one. I just wanted to put a disclaimer out there. When you say working with me, I'm afraid people think, "Oh, he was a patient of Steve's." Oh yes. <laughs> no, he was never a patient of mine. So let's put that out of your head. He is not crazy, criminally or otherwise. So um, yeah, I actually this comes up every week in my life. Um, in your, like in the therapy office? Well, I hope so. Not in my marriage. And, okay. <laughs> and, uh, it's, it's kind of a big deal, but it's a simple thing. I think, mm -hmm. I don't know how you're going to possibly fill an hour, but you do every week with your incessant questioning of me. <laughs> and it's, it's like being on the witness stand in court. Yes. But it, I think the big, the big thinking error is so many men and women think, Oh, I need a boyfriend or I need a girlfriend. And, and that's their, their strategy or, you know, their strategic thinking goes that far and becoming okay with rejection usually follows or is simultaneous or, sim, uh, or it's co-occurring to use a therapy term, uh, with accepting that, no, I don't need a girlfriend. I need the right girlfriend. And so if various other people are disqualifying themselves from the role as boyfriend or girlfriend. That's actually a good thing because getting the right partner is made up of a lot of different beliefs, not just that I have someone who's willing to be seen with me in public and doesn't run away when I come to her house or doesn't hang up the phone <laughs> when I call, but somebody who actually likes me as much as I like them and who is willing to express that as um, vociferously, as passionately as I myself am able to do and, and as much as I myself might need. So none of us want to be with someone who could eh, take us or leave us. Mm. Meh. You know, we, want, we really want to be with somebody who actually loves us. And otherwise, we fall back on our, our prior strategy, which leads into finding uh, someone in our lives, and that is developing a life worth living. So if I'm de developing a life worth living, that means on my own, I, I have a life that's so enjoyable, so wonderful, so intriguing to me with all my nerdy little hobbies and my career and my friends and my dogs and the beautiful world around us. Um, if I have that, then dating is a, should be a part of that. Mm -hmm. And dating, one of the great things about dating even the wrong person is that there's I get this wonderful pleasure of getting to know another human being, which if you take your time, it is quite pleasurable. And especially if one holds this loosely, as opposed to, you know, one of those movies where the guy is 
desperately clinging to the rock face with his fingernails, hoping he won't fall, <laughs> to be to be really relaxed as you as you sit drinking your cappuccino or whatever it is you're drinking, and then to to get to know this person really well, and of course letting them get to know you as well as they want to, and at the end of I don't know however many dates it takes to someday realize, yeah, I'm not really the right person for them. For it to be okay to say, yeah, I'm not really the right person for you. <laughs> and for her to say, no, I, I don't feel that way at all. Um, because if I'm not feeling it, it's they're not right for me. Because I think people deserve to be with someone who's crazy about them. Mm. And if the other person rejects me, <laughs> perish the thought. Who could believe such a thing? <laughs> if the other person rejects me, well, then um, that's really good intel. I, I want to know, and God bless them, coming from a person who doesn't believe in God, God bless them for being the kind of person who could just tell me, I'm just not that into you. Mm -hmm. And and that's really good. It means I don't have to spend more time dating, getting to know them. I can... Uh, expand my search to include others yeah yeah so her spot on thursday night at 7 p.m <laughs> is now open ladies <laughs> <laughs> so that's it all right let's wrap the podcast no <laughs> no that's great that's a great overview of everything i i think yeah it's are a, we done or do you have no more? yes but, but no, i think never. there's a um to get to that point there's a journey that you have to take i believe i think there's some sort of so i want to now now go back to back in time and think about when you were a kid and like what was because it's like even people have the fear of rejection to the point where they can't even like approach women or women maybe can't approach guys or this this is so deep-seated and it's like how what was it like for you because i know for me i had that fear for quite some time and it wasn't until like yeah. i became aware of this stuff so it's like because you didn't there's you didn't just enter dating just completely immune of it right well i sprung forth fully developed from the brain of <laughs> zeus and uh and i had all these thoughts from the very first day but no i i, I certainly did not i was probably like most everybody else i say most because i do imagine there's some really healthy people out there um, but i was not one of those i was just really needy and clingy and really unsure of myself and i i think your questions, you know, you always do this to me. You always ask me like, well, what about you? What was your development or your path <laughs> like or your trajectory? And I, and I think it's a good question because it really gets to the heart of the matter that it's not all about uh, intellectual ideas. It's not just about sitting here in my chair cogitating mm -hmm. because there has to be, get this, an emotional foundation mm -hmm. to intelligent thinking. There's this emotional foundation to finding love intelligently. Mm -hmm. And I think this emotional foundation is coming to a place where you can say, I really do enjoy my life. Yeah, you know, I, I said, um, I had a client the other day who talked about not having enough self-love and he didn't really love himself. And I said, I wish you'd stop talking about that because it really creeps me out. <laughs> he, he he laughed and he said, me too. I really don't like using that phrase, but my last therapist said I should <laughs> and that I didn't do that. But I, for me, um, I've never really felt like I deserved love. And I think that, I think that there is a logic to that that's pretty compelling and pretty wonderful, really, emotionally when you think about it. Because to say that I deserve love means somehow I've earned it mm -hmm. and that she, whoever she is, is cheating me by not giving it to me and then i develop a sense of entitlement and resentment and all that goes with that and really nobody has any control over whether or not they fall in love with anyone and women by the thousands have found me quite resistible mm -hmm. so if <laughs> if anyone does fall in love with me um and then it turns out to be mutual that's great but it's a lot easier to fall in love with me or any other guy, I think, if that guy is really comfortable with his own life. Mm -hmm. So the goal isn't really to find someone. The goal is to, to really develop my own life 
and figure out a way to enjoy my life. And then I'm more relaxed, I'm more confident, I'm more comfortable, and I can freely let others into my world. And I don't, I don't need to lie nearly so much mm. and pretend to be someone I'm not so that maybe she'll like me because perhaps on that day I'm doing a good job of mind reading and I know that she really wants me to go to craft fairs all the time. So yeah, I love craft fairs. Yeah. You know, that kind of uh, stupid lying that we do with it back and forth with each other. Men and women do it. So I don't feel it's a particularly a man's problem, but getting to that point where I've lived a good life. And that took me, gosh, I mean, years to figure out that, oh, job one is figuring out how I can have a life worth living. Because that never was explained to me and never occurred yeah. to me. So my early journey, to, I know you're not dying to ask me, so when did I discover that? <laughs> well, it wasn't until after my first rather awful marriage um, fell apart. And then I realized, you know, I was doing years long debriefings, thinking, talking to friends, even to date dating partners, figuring out where did I go wrong? I mean, I'm such a great guy. I'm so smart and ruggedly good looking. Why, <laughs> why did I, why did I lose my way and, and goof up so much in my selection process? And I think it was because I was so needy. Yeah. I had let myself be needy and then normalized being needy. And nobody had ever challenged me on that. Nobody had ever said, well, you know, no woman in her right mind is ever going to want to be with you. Mm. You're going to end up with women who are not in their right mind. And that's actually pretty much what happened. Would you say that it's the idea of loving others over yourself or looking for love in others rather than finding it in yourself? I mean, again, that's maybe self-love stuff. And Gosh, that sounds really noble and good. I'm not that guy. I, um, but, it's, but it's creating a life worth living, say. It's creating a life that you love. <laughs> Oh, yeah, for so, me is creating yeah. a life that so I love. So if you focus on, most people do the opposite, though, I feel like. I feel like they're mostly trying to find love and then create a life out of that that's going to be. Yeah, I want her to love me in my emptiness. Yeah. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like, it's like if it reversed, like if I knew, because you're so, you grow up and you're probably just so, I need to find a girlfriend, I need to date, and there's pressure, societal pressures. I mean, not as much as it was back then to get married or to have a relationship. Or It always feels like there's pressure, I think, on everybody to, like, what's wrong with you that you can't have someone? Mm -hmm. with, why don't you have a girlfriend? Why don't you have a boyfriend? Why don't you get to get with someone? I mean, <laughs> but if I heard, like, oh, if I was 23 and it's like, just focus on you and create an awesome life for yourself, it's like, oh. I haven't even had that. And then it's like, and then, <laughs> And then it's like, and then if someone's like, yeah, have man, create an awesome life, love it. And then next thing you know, you'll start meeting people. Yeah. I think with, um, gosh, there's so much to say on this topic that I thought was so easily handled, <laughs> like one or two lines, but you know, um, AA has got a wonderful tradition in that they say that this is a program of attraction rather than promotion. Mm. As opposed to most religions, which are mostly about promoting the religion and, you know, you should follow the Lord too. Um, but in, instead being, having so much from the program of AA that other people kind of see what I have and they crave it and they want it. And that's sort of my approach. I would say that's actually wholesale. My approach to um, finding love in our lives is, first mm -hmm. of all, uh, control the things you can't control which would be your life. You can't make anybody out there like you or want to date you or fall in love with you. So why not just work on having a great life? And then what happens? But really quick, people think they can. Can. Make people fall in love with them. Oh my gosh. Them. Yeah. That's, isn't that another whole podcast? Didn't we do that one? You know, it's just so impossible because there's no control. I, mm -hmm. You can't influence or or control or use any other magic word to try to claim some sort of control over the other person um, because people fall in love with Adolf Hitler and serial killers in prison mm -hmm. uh, and out of prison. And people don't fall in love with some of the most wonderful people I met. So there's no guarantee for any of us that we're going to find someone before we pass uh, or slip uh, the coil of this earthly veil. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that just knowing that then get busy with 
living your life. Mm -hmm. So generally speaking, instead of, and what do so many people do? They go to bars yeah, or they go to churches or they go somewhere where they think there's a happy hunting ground of the opposite sex. Mm -hmm. when, when really I think it makes far more sense just to pursue your own life in terms of what you like to do, joining groups and clubs and associations and taking classes and doing all the other things human beings do when they're passionate about something, whether it's physics or bird watching or learning how to uh, crochet, you, you get into a group of people who share your passion. And then if you're remotely interesting or enjoyable as a human being, if you know your manners and you bathe properly and you wipe your nose <laughs> and don't pick it in public, if you, if you do all these things to be normal, then people start thinking, oh, I'd like to introduce him to my daughter or I'd like to introduce him to my friend. And uh, sometimes it's the actual person in the class or in the group. But I just think everybody, in, and this is particularly true post-COVID, isn't it, that we all tend to isolate so much. We tend to stay at home. We're online. We're, you know, I have clients who tell me they have lots of friends. I say, well, tell me about your friends. Well, they're all online. Yeah. Do you even know where any of them live? Well, I think some of them live in America. <laughs> you know, it's like, come on, those are not friends. Those are really not what we mean by friends. So developing a life worth living helps me to be more comfortable. Confidence grows out of feeling comfortable with yourself. And then out of that, all of a sudden you're somebody people are attracted to. Mm -hmm. Look at him. He looks like he's having a great time. He looks so at ease. He doesn't look needy at all. In fact, oh, what an enjoyable conversation we can have. And then eventually you keep meeting enough people who share enough interests. You're going to end up with somebody, whether you like it or not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And then those people, if if they, those people are living that life, they're able to be rejected and not be destroyed by it. They're not going to go home and such a know. big thing, right? I mean, yeah. the word devastated is one I hear in my office all the time. Mm -hmm. Well, I just can't face it and any more rejection. I'm just so tired of being rejected. It's just so devastating. Mm -hmm. And but if if you're living a great life, it's as if the game show host is said, you, you win that wonderful, amazing life that you just had. Only now you're free of somebody who doesn't like you. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's a good thing, right? Isn't it? Isn't it, that it great? Is, yeah. When you, when you frame it that way, that's a, <laughs> you need to be frame it like a game show host. <laughs> well, I think so many of us feel like we're handed our life back. Like it's some kind of a white elephant or mm -hmm. this, Oh, uh, kids, you might want to put your hands over your mom's ears. It, this this piece of shit life you were living until you met this wonderful, amazing person who just brought all this light and love into your being. Well, now she's dumping you hmm. and you get to go back to that piece of shit life. Now you can take your hands off your mom's ears. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and so, yeah, it's, it's not terrible to not go out to lunch with somebody who's not that into you. Mm -hmm. It's not terrible to not be dating or having sex with somebody who's just not that into you. In fact, it's actually kind of great. Mm -hmm. And it opens up your consciousness. It opens up your calendar. It opens up <laughs> everything, maybe even some space in your bedroom for lots of other fun. Mm -hmm. And then what about people like just even, do you think people who do have a fear of even talking to women is that something that they don't feel confident in their life like are they lacking something in their life to where that oh yeah yeah <laughs> because they don't have a life worth living that's what they're lacking it's like yeah well even I, looking at myself it's like because i <laughs> yeah no nah. i'm giving you that look <laughs> just so everybody knows why the conversation stopped all of a sudden yeah you know if i'm really loving my life and I'm, I'm loving what i'm doing I, I feel like i have meaningful work i have great friends I have uh, a cool apartment I hang out in mm -hmm. uh, or even a cool corner of my mom's basement. Okay, my grandma's basement. Um, whatever it is that I, I'm really loving, it's 
it's really okay to get rejected. It doesn't, it's not, it's only mildly disappointing, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I don't even know if it's always mildly disappointing as much as it is neutral. Yeah. And, and I don't mean by that, that I'm indifferent because I like people and like most human beings, I want to be liked in return. And I would more than uh, want to be the guy who's getting, who's doing the dumping rather than the one who's getting dumped. You'd rather be doing the dumping? Yeah, yeah. Um, Sometimes that's harder. Well, it is harder, but in that case, you just behave badly until okay. she dumps you and then yeah. you don't feel so bad. <laughs> no, I don't believe in that anymore. I think, I think dumping someone, and I'm using the word dumping even though it's horribly pejorative, and it sounds like a, a, an abusive kind of thing, mm -hmm. but letting somebody know that you've thought about it and you realize you're not the right person for them, which is a polite way of saying you're not the right person for me. Mm -hmm. Um, it's really doing them a favor. It's really doing mo both of you a favor Yeah. because none of us really crave to be with someone who doesn't love us. Mm -hmm. You know, we may look at, I call the, uh, the outer appearance, the, the candy wrapper, you know, the, the real treasure, uh, on a Snickers bar. And I expect some royalties from you Snickers, um, <laughs> is not the wrapper we may get in uh, captivated by the wrapper. She's beautiful or she's very much desirable by other people's standards, or mm -hmm. she's very talented and, and incredibly smart. Um, but all of that together doesn't really matter if she doesn't have any affection for me. Yeah. It doesn't really matter if I'm just not feeling it. You know, I, there is no woman on this planet, no matter how beautiful, who is considered attractive by all guys. And there is no woman on this planet no matter how mean others may have been to her, who isn't found attractive by some other group of men. Mm -hmm. So they're in that, I hate this um, soulmate way of thinking, but there really is someone out there for everyone. Mm -hmm. And it's just, you know, do we always find them? No, we don't always find that person. Sometimes we die alone. And, but rather than, fear that, why not embrace it and just do the very best I can to have a great life. And when I am having a great life, I really, I can still feel that, that missing part of my life because I, I'm an adult sexual being. I have all this love to give. And if I didn't have a girlfriend or in my case, a wife of 30 years, I would be, I'd certainly be feeling it. Um, I'd certainly be missing that, which I don't even know. If that makes sense. Um, but I, but I wouldn't be miserable. You know, I wouldn't be clinically depressed. I would be sad from time to time, kind of mm -hmm. wistful. Yeah. Like, gosh, I really wish I'd found somebody, mm -hmm. but it's a little bit like missing out on anything really. I mean, in life, we don't, how many of us get everything we want Yeah. in this world? You know, there are people who didn't want to lose their mobility, who are in wheelchairs, people who lost their sight and people who've lost their homes due to in bankruptcy or fire. And I think, I think it's really okay to be a little bit stoic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't think it's asking too much of any of us that we not be such um, spoiled little brats that we need to have everything go our way. Yeah. So the the thing about developing a life worth living though, is a message nobody gets. I think it's a message that should be in the ideal human sex education class. Yeah. I would, if I read that at that age, I don't know if I would have, I would have maybe been like, I don't believe this guy, this guy's full of it. I just no, need I a think girlfriend. You I think you would have, I think but it would have been would something. Believe. Yeah. But it would have been, it would have planted a seed. I mean, and I could have believed it, but I, I just, there's no teachings even how to think about this stuff when you're that young. Well, you know, there aren't, and there, and there aren't even for the older people. This is the only, this podcast and, and the books that I write are the only way I think uh, I've seen it communicated in the world, but you know, for I think even a very young person, say a high school age uh, person who's emotionally needy and lonely and really wish to have it explained that this idea doesn't just exist as a as a piece of advice, but just reason it out. If if you really think about it, what potential partner is really going to want 
part of your miserable life yeah. if you're miserable <laughs> being single. So the antidote or remedy for that is to develop a life that's so full of joy, so full of fulfillment that you almost forget that you don't have a partner. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, you automatically, again, back to that AA principle, you become a guy who's living a program of attraction rather than promotion. So you don't have to, you know, that thing, that embarrassing thing you do at the bar where you go up and say, Hey, how you doing? Hey, yeah. <laughs> What's up? What's up? <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to do that anymore. Yeah. You know, you get to just be friendly with everybody and mm -hmm. enjoy your life and go through each day with a certain amount of equanimity, if not actual joy. And you don't have to use any pickup lines. You yeah. don't have to learn any pickup lines. And you don't have to read any of those stupid books about how to pick up women. Yeah. You're just your authentic self. Yeah. And you have compl complete control over that. Yeah. I, th I really do think that some sort of thing that you, that is some sort of law of the universe or law of attraction that's working within this whole idea because I know for me, it seems to be to work. Well, when you put yeah. it in practice and I know- <laughs> And I also see the opposite side of me being that guy at the bar going up to it, like waiting for the right moment, <laughs> looking over. Yeah. Building if she up makes your, eye contact yeah. one more time, I'm going over yeah. there. Or building up your confidence, thinking like, okay, what am I going to say this, say this. And then, yeah, just. just I need another beer. Yeah, I need another <laughs> beer. <laughs> then finally you go up there and you're just completely, the neediness is probably just emanating from your being now i noticed because you're not a client of mine when you worked in that little line the law of attraction i my my brain kind of you know whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> because you know our lives go much better when they're based on reason and knowledge mm -hmm. and i don't think we need to make it mystical or supernatural to say well if i'm just putting that out there then that the universe is going to hear me and by the law of attraction <laughs> you know i'll get back what i'm putting out and i i think no it's just it's it this is just a rational way to live one's life and it's also eminently successful it's eminently successful because you have control mm -hmm. and you're doing what you want to do and if you're bored on a given day, you have only to look in the mirror to see who's responsible for making the choices that have had you lead, leading a boring life yeah. and and go out and explore. It's a big, beautiful world we live in. And from literature to nature to friendship to just visiting the local dog pound and adopting a dog. I mean, whatever it is, there's just so many things waiting out there for us to discover and to enjoy them. Yeah. But what if you just frame it in a mystic mind? What if you have a mystic mind and you're a more logical mind? Because <laughs> the mystic mind could be like, yeah, it's a law of attraction. And it's like, well, it's just not for me. It's like, it's still applying the same principles in ways. It's maybe just not going through the reason and logic parts oh of your God. brain. Oh my God. <laughs> you're undermining my very being. <laughs> <laughs> but some people live, you know, they all can't be, they all can't follow the it's this it's it's following the similar thing it, yeah but just, isn't it a superstition like well i just really took it to the lord in prayer and jesus brought this amazing partner into my life and blah blah blah, blah. no that's just i mean <laughs> just because something happens after i do something uh -huh. doesn't mean it's caused because i did that thing so yeah. i i just was given this lucky rabbit's foot by my uncle before he passed. And right after that, I got all these girls dating me. And it's like, all of a sudden, I realized it's the rabbit's foot. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> that's but, if they're putting like, I mean, that's an extreme case. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the law of attraction is kind of the same way. Mm. I mean, it's I, I if by law of attraction, we're going to just, if we're using that code phrase to mean, well, it really helps when you're self-aware and you're thinking about it. Yes. And and you're open and you're looking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you're going to see a lot more of any make and model of car uh, if you're actually looking for that make and model. But it doesn't mean it's caused because you were looking. Mm -hmm. It's just that now you're noticing what was there on a pretty regular basis probably all the time. Yeah. For example, I noticed in my youth, like say at age 18, 19, when I was in college, I noticed 
<laughs> no self-actualized, goal-oriented, intelligent women who are really going places. Hmm. None. Didn't see one. Yeah. Um, because, oh, my mind was already bent on a strategy based on I'm, I need to take care of the little woman. And so I got to find a, a woman who needs to be taken care of, one who's hopefully incompetent, goalless, and completely disoriented, preferably maybe <laughs> crippled with shyness. And if I could find that wallflower, because she has to be pretty, and if I could find that wallflower, I think we could make magic together. And so that's kind of what I noticed all around me were all these uh, amazing women who were fitting that description. But the truth was, my college campus, like any other, was full of amazing, wonderful, self-actualized, intelligent, goal-oriented yeah. women. I just didn't have eyes to see them. You were tuned into the wrong channel. <laughs> you, <laughs> you were. <laughs> yes. And it was probably from because of a past life. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was because of how you were raised or how you grew up. I mean- Yes. But, but yeah. then when you when you have the awareness, though, what if it's as simple as just like, well, I have the awareness, now I'm going to flip to whatever station I want. And, yeah. And then I'm just going to live my life that way. Yeah. And I think that's, and that's a process. You know, I think mm -hmm. Claudia Black, who is a wonderful author and lecturer and was a therapist, um, I don't know if she's still working or not, but she, she talked about the process being similar to um, walking along a trail and, and then falling into a hole. Oh, and then after a long time, you get out of the hole and then you walk along mm. the trail and you fall into a hole. Yeah. But then it, it doesn't take nearly as long to get to out get this out. time. That's a good one. And then like you're that. walking along and you see the, <laughs> and you see the hole, but then you fall into it anyway. Mm. You know, so there's this really gradual process that, you know, for me it took years to start really appreciating the fact, a fact that I think a lot of incels don't realize and a lot of, you know, really men and women who hate the opposite sex don't realize is that this earth is full of amazing, wonderful people. And if we don't see them, that's because we have blinded ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. I agree to that. Um, what do you say? And, and also like with that Claudia Black example, that's great. I mean, that's, that's such a good way of looking at it. Do eventually, do you just get past to where you could just continue on the trail? Well, as I remember, I, cause I heard her lecture once and it was, it was just such a joy to listen to her. And I, I remember she was taught using the example of seeing someone across a room, you know, and using that as the, the example. And so, you know, I would go across the room and, and go find the codependent messed up needy girl mm -hmm. each time. But then after I started going to Al-Anon and learning more about codependency and, how impossible it is to rescue somebody who doesn't want to be rescued and what that whole dynamic was all about. Um, then I, I stopped walking across the room at the party to meet those. Cause you can see them. You can just, your eyes picks up on them the way a psychopath picks up on his next victim and you, or, or a con man picks up on his next mark. And, and I, I could see them. And then I just, I, I stopped I stopped walking across the room. I stopped even looking at them. And after a while, I couldn't even see them. I completely did a 180 from searching for them and not seeing the other healthier demographic to not seeing the, uh, the group that was really needy and then going all the way to where I could just see, oh man, there are so many amazing women in this world. Wow. And then right along with that, amazing men, of course, because I was already learning the value of friendship. Mm -hmm. And and so when I started realizing how absolutely amazing men were and what the gifts they brought into a relationship that uh, it was just so, it was so satisfying and so ennobling. It, it really fed a deep part of my soul. And I I just started making better and better choices. So hmm. over years, it just got better and better. And 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 yet I still have clients who come in, well, my last five girlfriends were all alcoholics or, you know, my three ex-wives are all this. Yeah. And what do you say to those people? And, and well, like, depends yeah. where they are in their journey, right? Because oh, yeah. some of them are still blaming women or men mm -hmm. for, and then I 
kind of gently but assertively point out that these were not arranged marriages, were they? And so you pick them out. And so really the problem is within you. You know, they they jump over the counter and start (laughs) Start, strangling you. Start beating on me. (laughs) No, most of them are, I mean, really, they're shocked and appalled, but they're also relieved because, ah, finally, somebody explains the madness I've been living Mm -hmm. and that it's now under my control Mm -hmm. because they used to feel, um, what's the right word? You know, victims of a drive-by shooting, you know, Mm -hmm. it's kind of like, why does this keep happening to me? You know, and no, it's not happening to you. You're choosing Hmm. these people and you know, this is what you're building with your life. Yeah. But we can do a better job of building just like somebody with a, a hammer and a saw can do a better job of building a house than somebody who just drives by the, the building site and throws the lumber off the, off the uh, pickup truck and just starts hammering and sawing and, um, you could actually start with a plan yeah. <laughs> and decide you're going to build it according to your needs instead of just make something happening. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. I like the idea of like just telling them like it's a TV, <laughs> it's like a TV station. I sometimes think of my parents, like they're still watching local TV. Oh, they are. And it's like, you know, that's the thing. I didn't even know you could do that. Yeah. It's still a thing like basic cable and stuff like that. Oh, okay. And um, I'm like, you have all this streaming services with like some of the best television that's been created in the last, I mean, in forever. Since the beginning, yeah. And you're watching whatever show with the commercials. I'm Let's like, just say it, Fox freaking news. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but again, like doing that with your life, I think it's, yeah, just shifting out of that is good. Oh, yeah. I want to ask too, um, so you say too that um like so would you say that like if somebody who who has like this like some what if somebody who wants to everybody to like them is that like a disorder or something or is that like I hope not cuz I want everybody to like me um but it's a cruel cruel world <laughs> <laughs> and millions withhold their love from me hmm. so well billions withhold their love from me so I think um you know, normal human animals, and we are animals. Uh, and if you wonder about that, just wonder for a minute if we're mammals, because all mammals are animals. So, I, and I think humans are mammals. Um, so we all want to be like we're a, we're a social animal, and we want to be liked. We'd like to get along with everyone. Even the sickest among us, I think, would like to be liked by everyone. Even if even the person who creates needless drama, who's need, needlessly antagonistic and combative and contrary, uh, deep down, I think, wants to be liked. Mm-hmm. But we engage in a lot of self-defeating behaviors. And frankly, there are a lot of people whose ability to love is quite impaired for a variety of reasons, some of it genetic, some of it um, the way they were reared. And so... Yeah, there are a lot of people who are incapable of love, but I want to be loved by everybody. So, so what's your point? <laughs> so the point is then, like, but rejection though. So that's like a huge fear then to have. It will happen. Yeah, that but, should also be part of that human sex education. Mm-hmm. You will be rejected, but it's but always it, good news. But does it mean that they don't like you? Because people say a lot of times, "Well, it's not you it, it's always the other person so it's, it's not you it's me it's them you know, like it's is it the other person like it doesn't have if someone rejects you does it have to do with your like who you are as a person as much as some people think it does well you know i suppose there's some there's often a truth in what you're saying and i'm trying to be gentle and forgiving when i'm talking to you like this but i think <laughs> it is also true that people you know, out there by the millions could look at you and me and say, no, it's just you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't like you. And, and, and you embrace that now. Yeah. I, th- I think that that's, I think that, that, well, I'm not delighted to hear that. However, <laughs> I not only accept it, but I'm grateful for the, um, for the honesty and the openness when somebody says, 
no, I really don't like what you stand for. I don't like your values. I don't like your sense of humor. Mm -hmm. And I especially don't like your fashion sense. <laughs> and so, you know, if somebody's like, well, okay, then I, I mean, what is there to resist on that? Mm -hmm. I mean, they've made it categorically clear that I am rejected on every level. Yeah. And although she didn't say my lovemaking, so maybe <laughs> I was okay there, but whatever it is, I mean, if all that rejection is ultimately about her, mm -hmm. but it's to some degree about me. Yeah. Um, so I you suppose, don't buy into that idea where it's just it's, so painful and so it's not about you. It's like it's always the other person. It's like there is No, some, I do. I mean, at least I comfort myself with that. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, if I like pick a neutral inanimate object like uh, a hamburger. Mm -hmm. There are people who like hamburgers and there are people who don't. But is that about the hamburger? No, of course not. It's about the person. Mm, okay. And you and I are kind of on the level of the hamburger. I didn't like this metaphor where it was going, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm a vegetarian and now I'm a hamburger. <laughs> so anyway, I I think that it's I I think the rejection is ultimately about them, but it may be for good reasons. I've been rejected by many for quite good reasons. I mean, I've, I've seen a number of women I've dated over the years do the eye roll when they found out that, oh, I never get angry mm -hmm. is what I disclosed. Yeah. And of course they knew that I was self either lying or self-deceived mm -hmm. because everybody gets angry. So an intelligent interviewer is going to run into something and they're going to do the inner eye roll if they don't do it overtly. And they're going to realize, yeah, this is not going to work for me. And so in that sense, they are rejecting the person. Mm -hmm. But it is about them because they just want somebody healthy <laughs> yeah. or somebody normal mm -hmm. or somebody with whom they can actually have a real conversation. And and then I've dated and, – and vice versa. I've dated a number of women who caterwauled and complained that I wanted to talk too much. I don't mean talk incessantly, but I wanted to talk about issues mm -hmm. and or that I was thinking too much. Why are you always thinking so much? <laughs> <laughs> and I just, you know, mentally would be drawing a line through their name on the list of, you know, possible candidates for a leading role in my life. And uh, OK, next. <laughs> <laughs> and I think women do the same thing to us, at least yeah. the healthy women do when we are unhealthy. Yeah. And then there's the other thing, you know, I mean, sometimes it's, it's stuff that people can't really help. We all, intelligent people have deal breakers. Like, um, if he's abusive, if she's abusive, that's never going to work out. It doesn't matter who they're with. They're never going to have a happy, loving relationship. Somebody who's chronically mentally ill, but never chooses to do anything about it. Like somebody with a drug addiction problem or somebody with a chronic, uh, depression or, um, any other disorder. But if we, um, at least for me, those personal, I feel a little more sheepish. Um, and the things that are really about me are the, are the deal breakers that are strictly personal. Like I don't personally think there's any moral, uh, objection to people smoking cigarettes. I couldn't care less if somebody is a smoker, mm -hmm. but I know that it would never work for me. Yeah. And so, yeah, that is about me in a way, but it, they could also, you could take it being about you, but it's really, I just, I, I just know my weaknesses and I'm not able, I would never be able to be happy in a house with a smoker. Yeah. So, and we all have personal deal breakers like that. Mm -hmm. so what do you think about the concept of, like, would you say people about this fear of rejection, like moving beyond fear beyond rejection beyond even death like beyond like embrace like to infinity and beyond well yeah. you, you get what i mean like just no <laughs> i have no idea what you're talking about like if you could go beyond like beyond the fear of, like get past it where it doesn't bother you anymore okay and like so that's one thing and then you do that by creating life worth living for the most part right and then just so moving beyond that and then even moving beyond other things that may impede your life in a way that cripple you or cause you to react in a way that's maybe not so pleasant. Can you give me an, an example of what you're talking about? 
Well, I guess with the rejection, I think it's just like one, just moving beyond these things that are holding us back. Like, I think there's things in life that maybe keep us stuck in certain places. Like I'm thinking like rejection, for instance, could keep you like having a fear of it and holding on to that could really restrict you from really meeting somebody good. And, oh. I, and I think like that carried over to other things in your life aside from rejection. Like some people are really afraid of dying and that could maybe restrict them from ever living a really I hate those people. fulfilling life. <laughs> hey, so are you saying like if I had a life worth living and I was really enjoying the heck out of my mm-hmm. life, but I still had a profound fear of rejection? Yeah, but I'm saying like the idea of like this is about embracing, like learning how to embrace rejection. So it's like right. if you learn that skill and you really kind of sit with it and go on that journey to go beyond it. It's like you could then apply that concept of moving beyond rejection to like other things in your life that are holding you back. Oh, like the fear of death. Like the fear of death. Or the or, fear of success or the fear of... Whatever it may be. Yeah, it's taking like, any risk like mm-hmm. with your career or your academics or anything like that. Yeah, I, I suppose so. You know, like um, the person who... I hadn't really thought about this, but which isn't surprising because you never tell me what we're talking about. <laughs> but yeah, I think it becomes a way of life. And and rather, not that we're perfectly fearless because every normal person has some fears, right? Uh, we fear discomfort. We fear uh, negative consequences that could really bother us and affect us. But the idea of, well, what would happen if I don't try to live my life? Mm-hmm. And I just go to my grave without ever taking the risk of, let's say, speaking up and and standing up for what I believe is right. Um, or what about the, the person who never steps away from a horrible marriage? I was talking to somebody the other day who um, has never been happy in his marriage in like 40 years has never been happy, but he made a vow, Mm -hmm. you know, till death do us part. Yeah. And so till death do us part, that means you have not embraced that emotional foundation of life that includes an openness to the idea of being wrong and a humility about that and accepting that Oh, these rules that we've codified, like till death do us part, or you should never get a divorce. Those rules were meant to serve us, not dominate us. So actually, anyone listening to this podcast is far more important than the rules that they try to live their life by. Mm-hmm. Some The rules can only work so far until they may need to be adapted to to an unforeseen circumstance. Mm-hmm. I like the idea of till death do we part. It sounds wonderfully romantic. And um, for Romeo and Juliet, wow, that was, that was a short journey. <laughs> <laughs> but for, but for the rest of us, it, that is a journey that could take way too long if we're leaving unaddressed, you know, profound abuse in the home. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was talking to someone else who, whose father was an incredibly abusive man and the mother only divorced him after 16 years of marriage. Mm-hmm. No, it was actually 17, 18 years of marriage. And so how, how awful would that be? And I think if, if we're going to say that, well, sometimes divorce is the right answer. Sometimes divorce is the answer. It's the remedy for all your ills right now. Mm-hmm. Um, well, that's that takes some courage to step away from a lifetime of belief in one way and then to embrace this new way. So, but then what happens if you don't? Imagine you're lying on your deathbed and mm-hmm. you've been married for 50 years to somebody you don't really like. Yeah. Were you doing anybody a favor? <laughs> I would say no. Mm-hmm. You know, certainly not yourself, but also not them. Yeah, I agree. Well, that may, could transition into this thing. So, One of my biggest lessons with rejection was in my last relationship and um, about like when we were breaking up, she's like, yeah, I was, I was over the relationship after a year or something like that. And how many years were you together? About three. Oh, ouch. So I know that. (laughs) So what I think about with this guy though, that's 40 compared to and three, three. So I, I mean, I wish 
even though it would have sucked if she told me after year one, no, I'm not interested. Um, that would have saved me from much, much emotional catastrophe and devastation <laughs> to bring to bring back that word because yeah. I was in a relationship where I was trying and things weren't working out and she was still with me, but yet it was like she wasn't with me. And then when, when she said that finally, it's like all this stuff clicked and it's like, oh, no wonder we have problems with sex and we, she doesn't tell me she loves me and this and that. I'm like, that makes me so much more sense now. And then I remember yeah. telling her like, you know, if you get in another relationship, just promise me, not promise me, like she just, she could do whatever she wants. But I was like, I hope you tell the guy sooner than later because <laughs> this is very painful. Yeah, it is, it is painful, but you know, all's fair in love and more and that's on him because we want, a woman who's unloving to keep him really busy because then he can't compete with you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like tripping your opponent at the starting line <laughs> of the race. And I, I think, you know, if you're going to say at, she knew at 12 months that you were not the one for her, mm -hmm. she knew, okay, underscore that word, then at probably nine months, she was pretty sure. Mm, and right. at six months, she might have been 50 50. Mm. And so, wouldn't you even like to know at the 50 50? Well, now, mark? yeah, now you're really it right? was six months. <laughs> well, and that's why I have this standard. And I said it earlier. And, you know, it's like, okay, I don't think single people really value their singleness as much as they might because. When you're single, you have all of the options of life ahead of you. You can you can date whoever you want, and you can marry whoever you want, and you can go out with your friends or stay at home or do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. You have your freedom. You don't have to check with anybody. You don't have any obligations. You have no contractual um, claim on your time or your energy or your talent. So I've got options. I've got freedom and also privacy. If I want to watch uh, Science Fiction 3000 with a box of rich crackers in my bed at midnight, <laughs> I can do that. Um, and I have this freedom that allows me to enjoy that because no one else can say I'm keeping them up at night or that you know, I'm making the sheets all <clears throat> full of crumbs. Mm -hmm. So I get to do whatever I want to do. And, you're, and when we make commitments by moving someone in, or even by going steady, mm -hmm. um, we are giving up incremental amounts of freedom and options and privacy. Mm -hmm. And I just think, uh, for me, the ticket price for me to give up those things is I need to hear a clear message, not just verbally, but behaviorally. Oh, she's nuts about me. Yeah. She not only wants to be, but has eliminated everyone else vying for president of my fan club. <laughs> uh, eliminated. <laughs> uh, she is all in. Because I know it myself, and I think it's true of you. I, mm -hmm. I, I don't know you that way personally, but I think we both have the ability to love some woman like that, mm -hmm. where we're all in. Yeah. And why would I get together with a woman who has less ability to love than I do? That makes mm -hmm. no sense at all. Or who loves me less than I love her. And frankly, that's not the end of loneliness for me. I'm not interested in being with someone who sort of likes me. Yeah. You know, I mean, I could, I could share coffee with them and we could do an exploratory conversation with that person who's kind of interested. But by the time we're talking about commitments, uh, I need to have some very clear messages, frankly, that the really needy person doesn't dare hold out for. Mm -hmm. Because if he or she held out for those really clear messages, oh my God, I mean, that's, aren't you being too picky? You know, it might be forever before you hear that. Well, if it's forever, you're with the wrong person. You've been with them too long. It isn't that hard to get to know somebody, let's say in nine months to realize, no, I'm really crazy about this person. And I don't think nine months is an excessive amount of due diligence. I just plucked nine months out of the air, mm -hmm. but it could be six months, but I think definitely nine months at least because I want to really get to know them. I want them to get to know me. I want to see how she 
lives her life? What are her values? I want to have at least uh, three good arguments with her and see if we're we as a team are capable of conflict resolution, if she's willing to fight fair, meaning no abuse, but she's also able to resolve conflict. And, oh yeah, does she have the courage to confront me when she thinks I'm out of line? Mm. I need some time to assess all of this. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't want to be distracted by the fact that she's so desirable or so beautiful or, or so great in the sack. I, I, those are all wonderful things and, and necessary, ladies. I'm just saying that for Chase, <laughs> but they, they're not enough. I, I need the other stuff too. So, um, that takes a minute. Yeah. You know, and in my case, before my wife and I cohabitated, it was uh, two years of dating. Mm. And I think that was about right. And part of the reason it felt so right is we were both having such a great time dating. Mm. You know, we'd never enjoyed dating before. And this was the first time in our entire lives we'd really gone slow enough to savor the experience. Nice. So to wrap up, I would say managing love intelligently to do that would require you to learn to embrace rejection. Do you agree with yeah, that? Yeah, to embrace rejection as as not an evil thing, but it's like the weather. I mean, it's going to happen. Mm. And it's it's not good or bad. You can wear an umbrella, you can bring your galoshes, or you can bring a pair of shorts if you're going to the beach. Mm -hmm. But it's, you know, weather happens and or just dance in the rain. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> okay. That's that's such a great line. Let's stop with that. <laughs> okay, great. So to end, we have a listener question. And again, if you have a question for Steve, visit stevening.com and fill out the contact form. This week's question is as follows. Hi, Steve. Can you help my husband and I come to a decision about our daughter and dating? She is in the seventh grade and wants to date a boy who is also in the seventh grade. My husband says, absolutely not. She is too young. I think that we should allow it with parameters, set some rules, meet the boy and take those birds, take and take those birds and the bees talks up to the next level. I think if we forbid it, we take the risk that she will sneak and then feel leery about talking to us at all. What do you think? Wow. That's a deep question. And, and it's really a good one. Uh, and while I'm scrambling mentally to try to figure out the right answer that would be helpful, let me just say, you know, we were talking a few weeks back about um, polyamory. Mm -hmm. And I had someone uh, approach our office and who said that she didn't really uh, entirely agree. And I just want to encourage you know, anybody who's got a different point of view or a conflict with something I said to feel free to weigh in. If your if your question or your comments are interesting enough, we might even invite you to be a guest. Uh, and I, we we're really open to that uh, on this podcast, but with, um, but nobody will ever know. And I, I, I try to encourage people to think independently because I don't really know the answers to human sexuality. It's just too broad and too complex for any one person to figure it all out. But on the matter of seventh graders dating, I have figured it out. <laughs> so, you know, um, I do think if I could take this writer's, a woman, right? She, I could take, mm -hmm. if I could take her last comment and put it first, it's time to take the birds and the bees talk up to the next level, like yesterday or last year, mm -hmm. because your little girl who is just now reaching the age where she might be entering into puberty is um, a sexual being. She has always been a sexual being and she's going to benefit from age appropriate information and knowledge. And she's going to benefit from having relaxed, comfortable conversations with her mom and or her dad or the whole family about everything from dating to kissing to everything we can think of. So I think uh, adults are the ones who have to start those conversations. And when it comes to dating, you know, the thing I think for dad, <laughs> I would suggest just judging from his reaction, dad is probably scared because he's thinking in terms of what dating means to him. Mm -hmm. And when I talk about dating to at least half of my clients, they think I mean having sex with. Mm -hmm. And the other half of my clients are kind of thinking, well, it could include sex, but at least it means just going out socially and enjoying each other's company yeah. and still 
you know, and then there are those people like me who think, no, it's just a, a social rendezvous with a romantic and or um, sexual agenda. Like I'm looking for a partner in life and I'm interviewing various applicants. So with, but where do we start that learning curve of how to date and how to conduct the intentional interview that will inform you as to who's compatible and who's not, because that's the skill we want people to learn, uh, especially our own children to learn. When do we do that? How do we do that? Do you think you could really quick give, start teaching people at that young of age, even to start asking questions about like this girl asking questions about the guy, like, what do you oh, like? Absolutely. And he's like, Oh, transformers or <laughs> you think, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. You know, I think, you know, for mom and dad to sit down and, and maybe not dad, but certainly mom, at least if she's, you know, having a good relationship with her daughter to be able to say, well, I remember when I was dating, it was such a helpful experience to learn more about a boy and why they, some of them just weren't right for me. Mm -hmm. Now, if I were a young person and my parents said that to me, I'd be intrigued, like, well, like what, mm -hmm. what did you learn? And if somebody, you know, and I, there's like countless examples, I think parents could bring up and I think for that dad, though, the mom and the dad really need to decide what they mean by dating. Because if we mean, because honestly, if it means we're going to go down to the malt shop after school yeah. and, and share <laughs> a, a milkshake together, then that would be, I think, perfectly a perfectly normal activity. Mm -hmm where they're sitting in a public place talking with each other. Yeah. If, and I have plenty of clients who've done this too, where they're emotionally mature and they're dating girls much younger than themselves. Mm. He's 16 and has a driver's license and she's 13. Yeah. And I'm thinking, yeah, I'm with the dad on that one. That's just <laughs> no way. <laughs> there's something, first of all, there's something wrong with him. Uh -huh. And secondly, I don't want my little girl who I've spent 13 years of my life taking care of to end up uh, with this guy I don't really know anything about. So mm. it just, it depends what we mean by dating. And, and if we could, I think even the dad would probably give in if it meant Oh, she was going to invite him over to the family barbecue. Yeah. Or oh, she was going to invite him over uh, when the family was maybe going out to a, a movie or a concert or something like that. Mm -hmm. I think a little bit of supervision and a little bit of knowledge do a lot to dispel anxiety, you know, over our children. And the whole the old um, saw about the dad loading his shotgun when uh -huh. the boy comes over <laughs> and. and uh, <laughs> Uh, making it really clear when he's to have daddy's little girl home mm -hmm. and all of that business. I think that's actually very crippling and disrespectful of girls because I think boys and girls need to learn to make quality decisions so they don't turn out like I did mm -hmm. at 20 marrying the wrong person because I had no idea what I was doing or how to interview people or how to conduct an intentional interview uh, at any level. Yeah. Cool. And that's that. Great. Well, thanks for the question. Thanks, Steve, for answering. And it's great chatting with you as always. And we'll catch you all next week. Bye now.